All right. All right, we started. Oh my gosh. We have one minute. But, um, okay. Yeah. So okay. Hold on oh. one second before you start starting. Yeah, do your disclaimer. Okay. okay. First of all, I have to fix a link in our Discord because I put the wrong link. Um, second of all, if y'all could turn your mics off and your video off, that way it doesn't mess with Aaron's uh, quality. No, babe, you have to keep yours on. <laughs> now we'll be doing the entire class via interpretive dance. So no words yes. at all. Oh, God. Okay, I think that was all. Oh, man. Okay, you're free to, to do your, your thing. Lord. All right. So, um, first off, thanks for coming. This is a turn your video off. It just helps with the bandwidth or something. I don't know. Anyways, hey, Newt, how's it going? Um, stay muted. Um, <laughs> it, it's really cool. I'm seeing like a lot of my friends here, which is cool. And then I'm seeing a lot of names from a the contest, like Chris White. Um, and then some of my students like Lyndon and, and, um, and uh, Zox and like it's just really cool to see everyone here and um, you know it's kind of like we're together except we're not and that's super nifty doodle as well so um, okay make sure I'm still recording all right cool all right <laughs> please God don't let me screw this up so uh, I this is what I do basically for a living is teach people how to paint um, basically, um, I also do commission work. I work for companies like Flying Frog Productions. I'm their studio painter, and I'm I feel kind of blessed that they decided somewhere along the line that that I was just the guy. Um, and so um, I've painted literally everything you see that's in print um, uh, for all the box art and everything is me. So um, that's really cool. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's really cool. You know, it's it's neat to have that and and um, and have some of my work out in stores and stuff which is kind of cool but anyways um so that being said this is a free class so it's not exactly like my normal classes um i don't have a pdf at the end to give you and stuff but we will we are recording it and please god let this thing work um uh you should be able to watch it later um on the flying frog site um or their youtube page or something like that i'm going to get all the files to them and and so this will be up for everyone forever um, all the fans and stuff and that would be really really cool but um cool all right so that being said here we go um first thing is stay tuned uh i'm just going to drone on and on and on and talk forever and you're going to get really bored but just remember at the end of this um you'll get to see some of the new figures from the the revised box set editions um uh, hopefully it shows up okay on your computer and it's not too blurry, but again, I'm recording this, so, uh, you'll be able to see it better. And also check the Facebook, Shadows of Rimstone Facebook page. I'll be posting pictures there, um, for everyone to check out. Um, the new figures are awesome. They're just amazing. Um, they, they honestly, they have learned so much over the last few years. Um, you know, if Forbidden Fortress isn't proof of that, the, the sculpts are super clean and everything, but also their scale, they've got a little bit of scale creep and their heroes are bigger now, um, than they were before, which thank God, because my eyes are getting worse every day and it's just so much easier to paint. So when we do the painting faces, uh, class, uh, maybe I'll show some size difference between the new models and the old models. Um, and it is super, super awesome. So anyway, stick around. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to show you pictures, um, later on. Um, but for now we're going to jump right into, um, how to do this stuff. So let me see here. Um, so, uh, first things first, uh, I need to go over colors that we use. So, uh, when I'm choosing colors for a miniature, um, uh, we probably all know that, um, when, when, uh, when you're playing games and stuff, or even just photographing your work online, whatever, um, but most, mostly playing games, like in a game store or at your house, the lighting is usually pretty bad. Um, and so things just look really, really dark, no matter what you do. And so one of the ways, one of the tricks that I found that really annoyed me for years and years and years, one of the tricks I found is to use saturated colors. So I'm going to show you two colors here that um, these are both Citadel paints. 
Um, I am not, me personally, I know uh, Shadows makes their own paints um, from Army Painter, and these, these paints work really, really well. But I'm the type of painter where I don't care what the brand of paint is. They all work pretty awesomely. You go for colors. So if you're painting just Shadows of Brimstone, um, I would get the Shadow sets because they have particular colors for particular things, like Crimson Hand Red and stuff like that. So it helps you in your color choices. But... For normal uh, everyday life, I use everything. I use Nocturna, Citadel. I do use the Shadows of Brimstone paints. Um, uh, P3 are great paints. I go for color. That's it. So I'm looking for really saturated colors. Um, here we have two colors. And you would say, if I just held up this color right here, that one's very desaturated compared to this red. Um, saturation is like 100% that color. So if it's just red pigment, um, as long as there's no other pigments in it, it's a pure saturated color. So I look for colors that are very bright and very saturated of a particular color. So if you look at these two, this one thing brown is very desaturated. But if I take the one thing brown by itself and put it next to this Rhinox Hide, now, let's see if I can get the actual colors in there. Now, this color is much more saturated. It's very, very orange. So a color can be both saturated and desaturated at the same time. I know that's kind of confusing, but if you keep this in mind, when you're when you're putting midtones and highlights into models, you want those midtones to be very saturated compared to your shadows. So if I was doing um, if I was doing something brown, I would probably start mixing in Morning Thing Brown as my midtone, and I'd use this Rhinox Hide as my shadow because that will help me. the The orange in this brown will show up much better than if I just add say white to this or a cream color to this brown so it will you'll get more bang for your buck so remember saturated color is what makes things look really good if you look in my screen up here i've got a picture of some of the 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 monsters from the new shadows of brimstone and you can tell that i used very very saturated colors except for in um uh oh shoot the harbinger my brain just died for a second um the harbinger is very desaturated but i used a lot of saturated colors in him to kind of make him look better so he's kind of got a yellowy uh, color to him but he's also got greens and oranges and reds and stuff like that that are kind of mixed in and they show up really well because he's so desaturated whereas with the goliath he's super saturated green but then in the shadows it starts desaturating very quickly um, so you get a lot more of the curvature of the model and, and volume and stuff of your paint jobs. So that being said, I'm always thinking about this stuff, um, especially if I'm going to go into dry brushing. So, uh, all right. So I'm going to now go over our brushes. Um, now brushes for dry brushing um, can use a lot of different kinds. I've got a whole bunch here. And um, so I've got these hobby brushes, cheapo hobby brushes. These ones are like 49 cents a piece. They're awesome. They're a size eight. I use them for, for uh, base coating and dry brushing um, when they start getting old. You can also use flat brushes like this. I think this is actually a filbert brush, but these ones work really well for dry brushing. But as you can see, they start getting really beat up very quickly. Um, I've got some other ones here. Um, these work good. I'm always looking for something that's kind of stiff like this because that will really give me, I can really rake that paint along the surface of the miniature. Um, but one thing that I've recently discovered um, is makeup brushes. And these are, this one's a Morphe one. It's an M173. It's just a big fat brush. Um, the cool thing about this, I've been using this for about six months now and it still looks like I just got it compared to this, which was like two dry brush sessions and now it looks like that. So one, they hold up a little bit better. Two, they're extremely soft. Three, they're kind of short and so they're, they're soft but they're stiff. I know, it's weird, but um, that really helps you with your dry brushing. So um, one thing to remember when you're dry brushing is once you, once you wash this brush out with water, um, it's done. So I had my daughter who works at Ulta pick me up a whole bunch of dry brushes for this session because if I got to change colors or something, um, I, w I, I, can't, I can't clean the brush. But if you put water in here, if there's moisture inside this brush, it will not no longer dry brush the way you want it to. Um, it'll be all messed up. So um, you want to keep that brush very dry and just have the paint in it that's wet. So um, those are brushes. Uh, I also have some of these smaller ones are nice for doing smaller details. So if I've got a, uh, uh, and I've lost it already, holy cow, where the heck did my, time out, how did I do this? Oh, okay, 
So I've got this model here. This is something that we're going to be dry brushing today and a, and a, a spider. Um, if I've got small areas like down the rib cage here, that, that this bigger brush is going to be very hard to get down in there. And let's say I'm using a different color than I used on everything else. Um, I can use a smaller brush to kind of get in those areas. So a couple different sizes is good. You know, um, you can also use like this Army uh, Games and Gears brush. Uh, this one is very small and, and this can be used as a dry brush as well. It's kind of stiff and just be inventive. You can find out cool brushes to use for this stuff, but definitely invest in some, some makeup brushes. All right, so uh, uh, the other thing I've noticed is bigger is better. So I used to dry brush everything with a smaller brush like this and I'd just be motoring all over the place, but a bigger brush goes faster, it's got a bigger area, it'll hold a little bit more paint and you can get a lot more done with the bigger brush. So I find that, that they work a lot, lot better. Um, okay, so to start with um, is color selection. So on this guy, um, uh, the studio version of this was purple, so let's go with the purple. Um, uh, to start with though, we are going to use a dark blue. So I am going to use this tentacle blue from uh, Shadows of Brimstone. And the cool thing about this is it's like a tealy blue, um, and that will show up dark, but on the model, but it will still, it will still show up, and that's the important part. So we get some of that. I always start with my dark color first. Um, you can kind of, uh, as with every technique, you can kind of mix and match. If you wanted to start with highlights first and work your way down, that would be weird, but you could do it. Um, I don't recommend it, but um, this is the way I do it. So I get a little bit of paint on my brush. Kind of dab it off but i still want it wet on the brush normally when you're dry brushing most people when they dry brush they wipe off their brush forever and then they and then they do it i want this to be actually a little bit wet so um i can start by dry brushing in the shadows now we're going to go purple here on this but i find that nine times out of ten i put a bluish shadow in things and the reason for that is blue is a recessive color and it looks further away it also looks darker um, than even black. So like if this guy was just staying black, I would, I could, um, I could uh, dry brush uh, some blue in the shadows and it would actually look darker on the bottom than on the top. So just remember that when you're, when you're um, choosing your colors, that little bit of blue really, really helps. So um, even sometimes in yellow, I'll put blue, which is, you got to be real careful because then you end up with green, but um, if you do it right, it works out pretty good. So I just kind of get this on here. Um, also notice I'm, I'm trying to dry brush since it's shadows. It would be just like if I was airbrushing. I'm coming from the bottom up to kind of hit those shadow areas. But I'm not super concerned about it because my highlights will cover up everything. So I can come from the top as well. Um, it probably pays just to put this everywhere. And notice I'm going in different directions all the time. Um, since my paint was a little bit wet on the brush, it's making little micro streaks and stuff like that in the paint job itself so that will add some texture in there later maybe maybe not but but at least you're you're doing the 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 steps to try to get some of that texture in there so that's a little bit blue um, i can always come back and bump it up a little bit more if i want in some areas so maybe up by the face i want i want to put a second layer on so dry brushing, it's very important to put these layers of dry brushing on. Um, build up your color so it's a little bit more vibrant. So this, this color, you could say this is a very saturated dark color, especially against black. And so what it's doing is that saturation is actually starting to show up in areas on, on the, the uh, model itself. So as I build it up, just get more and more and more of that and it becomes more and more visible so i'm kind of liking how that looks um, i'm going to put a, some more in the face here and right up in that area so i'm actually making uh the front of the model the shadows a little more saturated than the back of the model so whenever i'm painting i'm trying to force you to look at the front of the model so this is just and this is just in the shadow section so um you haven't even got to highlights yet but you're starting to see that i can see the front of this model better than i can see the back of it so that makes me want to look at the front of the model it's it's evolution there baby 
Um, it's just the way we're, we're geared. So get that on there. I'm going to put a little bit of shadows up here on top because I don't know if there's going to be areas um, where I want the midtone to go to shadow. So might as well be safe, better safe than sorry. I can always cover all that stuff up. So I get that first color on um, and I'm good to go. Now I want to start putting my, uh, my midtone colors on. And I was trying to find a really good purple. Shadows of Brimstone has purple. It's a little bit on the dark side, but let's see if we can't modify it a little bit to look a little bit brighter. So that's uh, on my palette cam there. We've got the purple and maybe I'll add, I'm gonna add a little bit of this stuff. It's called lipstick from Nocturna. Super, talk about saturated, that saturated. So whenever I'm buying colors, I look for the most saturated colors I can find. Even if they're a very dark color, like um, like this scrag brown, it's very saturated with orange. See how vibrant that is? So those are colors I look for because I can always desaturate them, but it's very hard to resaturate them. So um, I'm gonna mix in a little bit of that lipstick with the purple, just to try to get it a little bit more vibrant. And you got to remember, we're going over a dark surface, so a lot of this will get knocked down. You won't be able to see it as well. So sometimes you have to be more saturated than you think. Now notice, didn't clean my brush. I'm going to go right in to the purple. Knock a little bit of that off. I might knock a bunch of it off at first because I'm trying to get out that darker color underneath. And now I'm going to start dry brushing again Maybe starting in the front and working my way back. Now this one, I'm not going to dry brush from the bottom up. It's only from the top down. But I will still do a little bit of... Now see, that went on really thick, but that's okay. Because this is my mid-tone color. So put it on sort of thick. As I go back, the paint starts rubbing out on my brush, or running out on my brush, and I can start adding... A little bit more down into my shadow areas just like that right. so you can kind of see that saturated color is starting to show up now uh, much better it's, it doesn't show up a lot but since we're over a really dark color it's working for us we've got a nice saturated color there um, yes question um, Paul wants to know, would you use the same approach if the Void Hound was Zenithal Primed? Um, yes. Uh, you just have to be able to cover, you got to cover all that uh, white, basically. Um, let me see if I have a Zenithal Primed model sitting around here. Oh, look, I do. Okay. So if I grab this real quick. Now the difference here is you're going to have to put a lot more paint down to cover that white. Um, also, maybe I wouldn't worry about if it covered completely uh, because I can always come in with glazes and shadows and stuff. But I think right here you're actually doing yourself, uh, not doing yourself a favor like from starting from scratch. I would probably base coat this and then do a little dry brush on top. So that would pick out the highlights and stuff. So I'd skip all these shadow phases. Like I would, I would put those on with wet blending or something. And then I would switch to the dry brush to get those final highlights and then back to a regular brush to do regular highlights. So um, that can work. But the thing is, you're gonna get a much more vibrant color here too. Like see how that purple is really, really bright. Um, and then if I, if I dry brush it down here on the tail, see it stays really, really dark. So, I mean, it could totally work. It's just, you might have some problems with white peeking through. So, you know, it is what it is. But, all right, so let me get this side as well. So notice again, I had more paint on my brush. So I'm actually, it's almost like I'm painting. I also have a very light touch on my brush. Like you're barely hitting it. Like see, like no paint's coming off on my finger. You're barely hitting the model. And as I start running out of paint, I can hit it a little bit harder because I'm not, you know, now I'm just kind of, moving that paint around and what you'll find is when you're when you're dry brushing um like usually people don't like dry brushing because it leaves sort of a chalky finish but if if i keep hitting it over and over again 
it smooths that paint out and now it just looks like speckly paint in all different directions and that's what I want so it doesn't look so much like dry brushing it looks more like like some sort of weird painting effect where I got some texture and stuff so get that let's go back to this side starting to look real purple I'm gonna go ahead and in what's called insisting on color I'm using the exact same color again and again and again so I'm using that same purple. I know it's very vibrant and it looks good, but it will be more vibrant if I put another layer on. So I'm gonna just do that again. And the cool thing is, it really helps if you let each layer dry between each layer. Now granted, they're pretty much dry from the very start because there's so little paint going on. But if I was painting these, a group of these, you know, I'd do this one, put the purple on, do the next one, put the purple on, come back to this one after two or three, put the purple on again. So you're constantly letting that paint dry and you get to see, like have you ever noticed that that when you put paint on, especially over a dark surface, it turns, it gets darker once it dries. So it's good to see that what it actually looks like because now I can make decisions on, I need to put more paint on. If it's still wet and I do more paint on it, it will probably dry the same way as if I only put one layer. So it, it really pays to let those layers build up. So I'm going to do, I'm going to insist again. And here's something where I really pay attention. Like I've got my reading glasses on now. Um, A, because I'm getting old and I can't see. And B, because it gets me up a little bit more close and personal. And I start seeing areas where maybe it looks dry brushed. And I can hit those areas again and again and kind of get rid of that look, you know, by going in different directions. And maybe getting more of a textury effect, which is really, really cool. So now I'm hitting, I'm letting it hit a little bit more on these lips down here. He's got some real, those are kissing lips, let me tell you. Yeah, that's right. All right, so I'm just going to finish this one side of the model because I don't want, I know we don't have a lot of time. So um, this is like speed paint international. But you will notice that you can paint up a figure very, very quickly. So I'm going to do a third layer of this purple. And maybe just hit in certain spots, like his shoulder. I really like his shoulder being strong like that. So it's like nice and, and purple there. You kind of see how cool those those sort of tealy blue shadows are really starting to look. And the fact that we insisted on those and put them in a little heavier in the front is paying off. So we've got that. Now um, I'm just going to grab some of this lipstick because why not, right? The lipstick is super vibrant. And I know that a vibrant color is going to show up really good on the gaming table. So I'm going to start in with that. And maybe I'll go really light with it though. So I can already see a little bit of a difference there. It's very, very quick how, how fast that builds up. And it's building up that quickly because of the saturation in the color. The color is working for me. Um, if I had more of a desaturated color, like if I used um, this purple... This is very desaturated. See, it's got, it's almost like uh, pastel looking. It's, it's got a lot of white in it um, or cream or something. And so um, it's still very saturated, but it's not gonna be as bright as that magenta, as the lipstick. So I'm gonna grab some more of this lipstick color. If you have any other questions on color, this would be a great time to ask because this is the boring part where I just dry brush for the next 45 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but yeah, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, we don't have tons of time, but I will definitely answer them. In my normal classes, um, we do, uh, you practice this technique, um, and then we go on Discord, and in the class, I review each piece, and uh, sort of give my tips and stuff, you know, it's, it's you know, it's it might be a little bit scary at first posting your work, but it's all to get you better at painting, you know, I don't sit there and mock you or anything, but... Unless you want me to. Um, actually, we have a, a higher tier on the Patreon that lets me make fun of you and stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. What happened? Um, so we see this is starting to get much brighter. I'm going to put a little bit back here on his on his butt. He's got a cute little behind. We got that. That looks pretty cool. Starting to starting to starting to pop a little bit more. So I'll put a little bit more of this magenta. And this is something as far as color choice goes, you can pick any color you want. The, this, the, the principle remains the same. The more saturated the color is, the more it will show up. So if you just remember that, 
if you're if you're if you're doing this and it's not building up in color switch your color to a more saturated color more orange or more blue or more magenta or more yellow uh, any of those colors will will start making your your paint job pop a lot so we got that um, also just knowing how far to where to where to insist on your colors more and where to let them go a little bit um, that's that's also a personal choice um, and, and you just kind of got to paint miniatures to figure stuff like that out um, the more practice you do, the better you'll get at this stuff. So as you can see, this actually looks pretty cool. It's pretty clean. Um, with a few washes, I can get it even smoother and people wouldn't even know that I had dry brushed this model. Now, um, we're going to go into highlights. So how are we going to do this? So some colors look better with cream in them, like a color like this, Minoth White Highlight, and some colors look better with white in them. And you have to put those colors in those colors to find out. <laughs> so we have to do experiments. So I'm going to grab a little bit of this. And I'm going to put a little bit of white in it. Not that much. So I'm trying to um, make a very saturated, lighter color than this one. So this one's brighter than this one but this one's lighter. So I need a highlight, so I need to go a little bit lighter. So I'm gonna leave it like that. Now, I could kill it by putting a lot of white in it. Something like this. See, that's pink, but it's also dead. <laughs> it doesn't have enough saturation in it to keep my colors vibrant. This color hopefully does. So I'm gonna do a test with that. Um, let me also do a test just so you can see with this Minoth White highlight. Grab a little bit more of this. So Minoth White is a nice color to highlight with because it's got a lot of yellow in it. Probably a little bit of red too. Um, so that is the Minoth, or this is the Minoth, and this is white. I think this one's still more vibrant, so I'm gonna go with this one. So I'm looking for those subtleties because they'll help me with the, with the paint job. So now I'm gonna grab a little bit of that. Again, wipe it off on my on my palette. Now this one, this is your first highlight, so it's a very saturated version of your color. So I don't want to put a lot on it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure. Sometimes I rub it off on my thumb, just kind of dry brush a little bit, and get these cool effects. And all your friends and family think you're diseased or something. Um, with COVID going on, it would be really awesome because people would just be like, whoa. Um, so I will start putting that in in the areas that I want to emphasize more and be more highlighted. So you can already see a little bit of that highlight coming in. But I really didn't go much lighter than I already was. But it's very effective because of all that saturation. The saturated color, super important. Can you tell there's a theme to this whole class? Saturated color. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. Like this is a very dark, dark animal. You know, it's a void hound, so it's like they're evil and stuff. And so, like, I like them being darker. But that being said, how do you make something really dark look really good on the gaming table? And this is one of the ways. We're just starting to add some more vibrance to it. So I can already see that my vibrance is really picked up by adding this color right here. And it's, again, not much different than the first one. So let me mix up a little bit more of that because I talk too much and it's drying out even with my wet palette so a lot of times if I'm painting armies or something I will actually find a color that's like that um, just straight out of the bottle so I don't have to mix it or anything if I'm doing you know single figs display figs I just always mix because it's way easier but all right so I'll grab a little bit more of that And on there, it's starting to look like almost day glow. It's weird. I like it. I think I, I think I'm actually going to paint my void hounds like this. Um, <laughs> I was desperately looking. I painted all the miniatures they sent me for for the new uh, sets and everything, so I didn't have any of the new stuff really to 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 paint on. And I was desperately. I painted a bunch of my own stuff, and so this was one of the squads that I hadn't been painted yet. But see how that's like really, man. That's starting to pop. That's that's like kicking right there. Kicking it old school, as they say. Um, yeah, like that. Now, second highlight is we're going to kill this color. We're going to 
kill it. And take it to the bridge. Alright. So we got that. I am grabbing that color. Now this color is um, much more desaturated. So it's going to put little, uh, when something reflects light because it's a little bit shiny, um, it's, it's more white. It's more desaturated. So that's what I want. I want just a little reflection on certain things with this more whitish color. And so it needs to be in very small areas. If I cover up most of this saturated color, it's actually going to do the reverse effect. It's going to mess up our paint job. So you're being real careful. Um, this is called being delicately aggressive. <laughs> so you're being aggressive with your colors, but you're delicate with your application. Back when I used to skateboard, um, I noticed that the pro, a lot of the pros, they were very delicate in how they skated, but they were super aggressive and like, it was just unbelievable. So we've got that on there now. Now I'm going to add, uh, since we've already got our colors on our palette, ready to go. I'm going to add a little bit more white. Oh, we got to, you, you can just say we have a question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a question. Okay. Um, uh, Esteban said, talking about saturation, if you were dry brushing something like a leather brown, for example, would a saturated orange make sense? Yes. All day long. In fact, in our Discord, um, I was having a conversation today with, the, with the, I forget who it was, Dan, I think. Um, uh, in his leather straps, he had, he had done all this work highlighting them and putting little scratches and stuff in them, but it was with a very desaturated color. And I understood that because it was a very dark leather. It was like black leather, right? And so it's like, okay, well, that, that makes sense. You're going to be using like whites and stuff. And, and, and to get it to actually show up, you've got to put a bunch of white in there. And, and so he did all this work. But when I initially looked at the photo, I thought he had done nothing because it literally just goes away. Desaturated colors are uninteresting to our eyes and our brain. And so we don't recognize them very well. Like we, we tend to look for saturated colors like this. So I did a quick paint over and, and changed it to ochre. Now, the ochre, like on a strap like that, you're just putting little bitty line highlights at the top and the bottom of the strap, and it doesn't even read as ochre. But you can see it because it's ochre, because of that saturated color. So you're, like, I'm always, I, I, I know I say this in all my videos on Miniature Monthly and stuff all the time, but it's that saturated color that shows up. Sometimes it doesn't look like that color because the line is so small, but like if you've ever been putting in little bitty highlights and you put them in there and it's like you did nothing, you just can't see them because they're so thin and so tiny. Well, saturated color will help you be able to see those highlights. Now making those highlights a little thicker too will help too, but if we're using, if we're using color as our ally, it really, really makes sense. So a lot of times if I'm doing a really dark belt, I'll put a, I'll, I could, let's say in, I'm dry brushing it, or let's say I'm, do, I'm doing this rat right here, and I do really dark brown, and then I just want it to be a little bit lighter. I don't necessarily want it to be orange, but I want it to be a little bit lighter. I'll use that orangish brown, and I'll put it on real lightly, and what happens is it just shows up. You can see it, and that's at the end of the day when we're painting, all that matters is that you can see the model. That's it, so um, it's you know a really cool way of thinking about color and using, like, for the longest time, I just always added white or cream. And and I always had the same problem where, like you see up in this shoulder right here, I've got really good definition. You can see the, the volume of that shoulder. It's it's roundy looking. Um, if I had just used white in my, in my um, pink and made that really light, you'd probably lose that. It would start looking flat again. So if you're, if you're, if you're finding that your highlights aren't showing up, and this is going to sound weird, but make them darker. Take more of the of the magenta and put it back in your highlight color. And ma it, it's you're making something darker but brighter. And we need the bright to show up, and the bright will show up in the dark. So, um, I recently uh, did a, a dragon called Vermithrax, and some of you who follow me know that it got destroyed in a car accident. <laughs> so, but he had a like a fire belly, um, like smog, and. Um, and I turned my lights down. I mean, it was the most vibrant yellow in the center of his belly that I could possibly get. And I made sure to keep insisting on that and get it really, really saturated and vibrant. And I turned my lights off in our in our um, room, in our in our uh, hobby room. And literally, that was the last thing you could see 
on that model was that yellow stomach. I mean, all the other colors went away as it got darker and darker, but that color was so vibrant and so bright, it, it literally shone in the dark, you know? Barely, but it still did. None of the rest of the dragon you could see, you know? So that's the power of saturated color. It's very, very powerful. So now we've got our, our first highlight. Our second highlight is very light. You can't see a whole lot of difference and you don't want to. All it does is picks out the, the top edges of things. And if you notice, I didn't do a lot of it back here. I only did it in the front where I want the most detail to show up. So one thing that, that, that draws your attention to a model is saturated color. The other thing is detail. So if I can see detail in the front of the model, up by the face, better than I can see in the back, my eyes will naturally look at the front of the model because uh, I can see what's going on. Like it's, you know, it's easy to look at. Whereas the back of the model isn't as, isn't as focused because I haven't detailed it out as much. So on your gaming figures, the, you can use this as your, as your advantage. A lot of times when I'm painting something like, uh, let's see these Hellbats here. Um, so this is my own personal thing. I've just airbrushed it so far. Um, but I will, I will put more detail just in this area and I don't worry about the rest of the model. I, you know, I obviously put some highlights and a little bit of dry brushing and some shadows, but not much else work. And then up here, I'll put more details and maybe do some cool texture on the tongue or something. And that makes it so like, oh, that's interesting. I don't look at anything else. It's like mind control with your paintbrush. So remember that when you're doing this. Now, last step on this. So that's been dry brushed. It looks pretty good. It actually looks pretty clean. Um, even with my reading glasses on, I mean, it's a little dry brushy looking, but not too much. So now I'm going to put a final highlight on. So I've uh, added more white to my mix. Maybe I'll add a little bit of that Minoth white highlight because it's it's actually br a little bit brighter, I think, than white. So um, because of the saturated color in it. And I'm going to put that, I'm just going to put little dots. And actually, let me, let me uh, see if I can get closer, a little bit closer. All right. So that looks pretty cool. So now with these desaturated, um, with this desaturated paint, it's going to show up next to the saturated paint really well because there's contrast there. You have desaturated next to saturated, and so that's very very visible. So I'm going to put some little dots on the tops of these eye, the eyes here. Now this is an optional step. You don't have to do this because. Um, technically you could be done just with that dry brushing and then finish out the teeth and stuff and you're good to go. But I like adding things. Um, I figure I save myself enough time doing the dry brushing and I can come back in and do um, a few extra details here. So I'm being real. I'm using this 00, zero long wick brush from, uh, from uh, Monument Games and Hobbies. Our friend Jason and Jen. Um, and they make a little bit more affordable Klinsky Sable brushes. So like my really good brushes cost about $15 each. These ones are 10 to 12, something like that. They're much cheaper. Um, but they work really good. I find that I use, I use this particular brush for a lot of my final details. So I can just come in and hit a few spots. And this highlight shows up really well because it's right next to saturated color. That's the only reason. Um, if I built up my blends slowly from the saturated color to the desaturated color, I would I would not have the same effect. So you want that, again, you want that contrast going from one color to another drastic color really quickly. And this works because I'm just putting it on the edges of things. And so it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like I just have a line there or something. It's, it's much better. So I can always mix in between my colors, make a middle of the road color. Maybe as I go a little bit further back, put some of these little highlights on, boom, boom, boom. Very quick, very effective, very efficient, all that good stuff. Um, maybe putting my more saturated color down lower. So you can see the highlights get much lighter and brighter. And then as they come down here, it's just the saturated color. I'm going to put a little bit on this on his mouth here. All right. So I don't want to get too carried away with this. This is not a highlighting class. It's a it's something else. <laughs> it's 
dry brushing in shadows. Um, so we're going to switch to uh, putting in some more shadows with, um, with the washes. So let me just... My OCD is kicking in, sorry. I'm going to get a couple more highlights in here. I like wiping paint off too. It works. Like this. If you're asking questions, Liz has run off on me. So um, <laughs> you just have to wait a minute. So that's that's that. Um, we could even take some of that tentacle color and add some Minoth white highlight to it. And where you have sort of the visible shadow colors down here. I'm going to add a little bit of a highlight to them by using that color. So you notice a lot of my my brush strokes, I start going and then I, I pull away from the model as I'm painting and that lets it taper off. So I can actually get what looks like a kind of a blend, but it's really not. That looks pretty cool. You'll you'll find that like when you have shadow areas, if you put a little bit of light, a little bit of bright highlights down in the in the really dark, deep dark parts, um, it can look really really cool, and it actually helps you define the shapes that are way down low. Without without making it too light. So we got that. I'm gonna grab. I'll leave some of that color in my brush and make a weird pseudo purple highlight. Put that right there. I think that looks pretty cool. Now, I could do a lot more. I could put a few more highlights up here, but this is real quick and dirty, and um, and I think we got we got the look that we want. Um, let me put a couple more. There's little bitty rings around each one of these things. All right, this is back. Yeah, that's okay. So just kind of adding those highlights. So that looks really cool. Still, we're, we've we've gone really really quick. Um, have we only been going for 41 minutes? Wow. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're running out of time. <laughs> you don't have to speed. <laughs> well, it's it's hard because this is really okay. So I'm gonna add a couple more regular shadows or regular highlights. So I'm gonna add some more of my um, tentacle color into my pink. Um, to get kind of a midway between my pink and my tentacle, or my highlight and midtone. And I'm going to put those back here just a little bit. That looks pretty cool. Um, go a little bit more. So, a lot of this you'll find that, you know, maybe you try it at first, especially the highlighting part, and this doesn't work very well. Um, when I, I I understand where the highlights need to go maybe better than you do now, but that's where practice really comes in in the play and just start. Uh, we kind of got to train our eyes to see how we're supposed to view the model um, and where the colors are supposed to go and what, what looks good and what doesn't. Um, I think down here in the shadows, I want it to be more of this teal color. So go back to this. If you make a mistake, it's not a mistake. You just come back and fix it. So that kind of changes from the magenta to teal. That looks pretty, pretty cool. All right, so now um, if you want to go in and shade things a little bit more, uh, I'm going to show you how to create some washes to shadow your miniatures a little bit more effectively. So for this, we do have this Shadows of Brimstone Strong Tone and Soft Tone Ink. So the, the Soft Tone Ink um, is, is more brown. It's a little bit lighter. And the Strong Tone Ink is a, got a little bit more black maybe in it. It's, they're both brown inks. but So you look at this and you're like, all right, so that's going to be weird on this purple guy because um, 
You know, why would I put brown in? Now, brown is the ultimate desaturator. <laughs> so if I want to make parts of this model go way even further, I could actually put brown in there, and it, it, it does help. But it might look a little bit weird. This thing looks really nice. It's got that bluish black down here, and it turns to purple up there. It's pretty cool. But so how do I turn these paints into something that I can use on this model? We have two questions. Okay, what are the questions? All right, All right so, the so the first one is from Nathan, Nathan but he kind of sort of answered his question afterwards question? Oh. um so he said question about fixing mistakes on heavy dry brush piece like this if you smudged or sneezed while throwing a highlight down how would you recover the randomness of the dry brush feels like it'll make it difficult and then he says as i'm typing this aaron says if you make a mistake it's not a mistake yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so yes, um, here's the deal. So we the, the cool thing is we've got our wet palette and that keeps our paints wet a little bit longer than normal. So you could go back in, um, like I haven't, I haven't cleaned my brushes, so I could go back in. Maybe I would grab a smaller brush like this one and grab just a little bit of that purple and maybe like get an area, like clean it off a little bit. Um, or you could make a, a, a glaze by just taking some water and mixing it into your color. So if I knew that there was, a, you know, kind of, it's not really on my palette. If, if I knew that this was kind of the color that I was using and I met, like I needed to cover up a highlight or something, I could come back in and glaze that back over it. Um, in army painting, there are no mistakes. Like. If, if it's a mistake, it doesn't matter. Like, just keep going, you know? Like, <laughs> learn from your mistakes. Like, I find, maybe I'll do all three of these, and I'll be like, I like the highlights on this one better than the other two. And I start, in my mind, recognizing why the highlights are better. Maybe I brought the saturated color down further on the on the arm here. So maybe I, I went in and I had more dry brushing there or whatever. But when I start recognizing those things, that next time I'm doing something like this, I will remember that and I will I will apply it. Um, changing it to fix something, I don't do a whole lot of that, especially with this, you know, with gaming stuff, because it just takes a long time. And sometimes if I'm fixing too many things, I get discouraged and I quit. Um, and I'm really, I'm a quitter, man. I, I will quit at the drop of a hat. So, um, <laughs> in fact, let's go play Warzone right now. Um, no. <laughs> anyways. Yeah, it, it's not it's not the end of the world. Um, like I said, like these these highlights right here um, that I've got going on, oops, um, that I've got going on his uh, body. Get it real close. They're definitely not perfect. I mean, you can see my brush stroke right there. Um, it's you know it is what it is. But for gaming stuff and on you know if this is on the table, it's starting to look fantastic, and that's all that matters. Um, if I want to put this into more display, then I start coming in and I start doing little layers and cleaning up where I messed up. So, and it kind of is what it is, but, um, don't, don't worry too much. I think the key to this is start playing with that saturated color. The more you play with the saturated color, I think the more you'll start understanding how those colors work in your favor and help you in your painting. And, um, and what colors, uh, you can use better for shadows, all that stuff. Um, so... I think that's the main thing. I mean, if you get anything out of this class, I want you to get that because most people have problems with just color schemes and stuff. That's why everyone does my, you know, my studio scheme. And I really, I love when people do something different, you know? I mean, I think it's great. I mean, because I think everyone else has better ideas than I do. So, <laughs> you know, and I think we're all kind of that way, but, um, you know, just play around with it a little bit. So if we're doing, oh, and we had another one? Yeah, we had yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so Peter said, this may be an outside, a bit outside the class topic, but a question about brush, brush technique mm -hmm. on the wet palette there. It seems like you use the paint straight from the bottle, but you are getting good flow off the brush. How are you getting that? If I try to get, if I try, I get dry paint on my brush. Um, I work quick and I look at my brush a lot. <laughs> um, so I've been trying to, to be less of a brush licker, but usually I'll lick my brush before I go to grab the paint. So maybe that puts a little moisture in the brush. 
The other thing is maybe use a bigger brush. So um, we've got here a Raphael 8404. This is this is the brush that I typically use. This is a size one. So obviously it's much larger than this double zero. Um, and it's it's actually larger than most brands size one. So what happens is, is it's the belly of this brush is much bigger and it holds a little bit of moisture. You know, even after you wash your brush out, um, there's a little bit of moisture that's left inside the barrel of that brush. And that will help to kind of dilute your paints a little bit, like microscopically, but just enough to keep them flowing off your brush. The other thing I do is sometimes I'll dip my brush um, and I, you can probably see in the very side of my palette, um, I don't have my palette paper all the way up to the edge, so I can actually grab stuff from the sponge and then uh, just put a little bit of water in there. Um, I try not to add too much water though. So part of this is I'm just quick. So when I grab my paint, I grab, I grab a little bit of this. This is thick paint right here. And I kind of flatten my brush out, maybe roll it to keep it in a point. And uh, so I've got, I've got this little bit of brush paint on my brush and then I can just paint it onto the model. So um, I find that when, when I'm painting, um, and for those of you who have taken my wet blending class, it's all about thick paint. Um, the thicker your paint is, and, and here's the thing, this color right here at 100% out of the bottle, that's the best that color will ever be. That's as bright, as vibrant. It's the best coverage it has. It can't get any better than right out of the bottle here. So once I start adding water to it, I start breaking, I start killing that. So if I put, uh, if we do skim milk, like the internet tells you, if we put skim milk consistency of water into this, um, now I've got, that's probably 30 to 40%, maybe 50% water to paint. And now I've got 50% coverage. I've got 50% pigment. I don't have nearly the strength of color that I had right out of the bottle. So. I like using this straight out of the bottle. I've just learned to put it on, I grab it and I put it on thin, a thin coat. And I can do less coats, I can do all kinds of cool stuff. And when it dries, it dries exactly how I did it. Um, if, if you have, if, if you're thinning your paints, um, you tend to get watermarks and stuff like that. There's all kinds of other things that, that problems that you can run into. Now, does that mean don't thin your paints at all? Obviously, if you can't get paint off your brush, you got you got a problem. So put a, a little, a little, like I dip the tip of my brush in water. I don't do it in my water bottle. I don't do it in my clean out bottle because from here that just soaked up all the way into my brush. So I always take it out of my sponge on my palette and that, that gives me a little bit more control or you can dip it in water and wipe it off. So it's just like wet. The brush is just slightly damp and then put it in, get your paint and paint with it. But I like having the thicker paints because it just gives me better coverage. It's better all the way around. So, um, okay, so uh, back to our washes. Um, so this is the dark tone ink right here. I'm gonna put a little bit on my palette. So what happens, we shaded, we shaded this. Let me see a good, good option for this. Let's say I want to put shadows into this model right here. Um, and he's green. The complement for green is wet. Everyone, raise your hands. Who knows? It's not necessarily red. <clears throat> this color green is a yellowish green. If you look on this color wheel, this is the real color wheel. Um, you can just download it online. I print mine out. <laughs> Um, it's from the realcolorwheel.com. There's pictures of it everywhere. It's nice because it has every color you can think of and I can find these colors in my collection rather than just have one yellow and I don't have that yellow. So anyways, so we've got this green is a yellowish green. So it's over here somewhere as opposed to like a bluish green, which would be over here and which of course starts going across from red. So if you have more of a bluish, like a tealish green, it looks great with red. Uh, more of a yellowish green, it wraps you back around this way, and it's more of like purple magenta. And the closer you get to yellow, it's like straight up purple. So, that being said, I need purple ink. Now, you could just go to your local store and pick up Druchi Violet. <laughs> That's purple. Or, I take my Strong Tone wash, um, most people have a black wash and they have a brown wash and that's it. Most people don't get different colors because they don't find a need for it. But 
I'm gonna put a little bit of this. Now, one thing that you'll notice when I do these washes, get this piece of paper here. I'm gonna show you the difference this wash in this wash. So sorry, this is like ghetto fabulous. Um Okay. I've never done a video with washes, so it's like super weird. Um, or I've never done a, a class with washes. Um, so this is this is a wash straight over white paper. So that's how thick it is. It's pretty thin, right? That's not too bad. Now the problem with these washes is I to build it up to a color I want might take multiple multiple coats and. My, my thing, whole thing is the more times I put a paintbrush on a model, the more times I touch that model with a paintbrush, it's one extra time that, I'm, that I can mess it up. And I mess up just as much as you guys do. I just do far less brush strokes. <laughs> so um, to get this color to be more opaque, we can add an opaque color. Also, I want to get it more purple because it's going to go over green. So... I'm grabbing a little bit of opaque paint, not a whole lot, and I'm going to mix it in with my watch. It didn't change the color too much, so I'm going to mix some more. But now you're starting to see it's a what? It's a purple wash. Holy cow! This is awesome. All right, and I can just keep putting it in there until I get the shade of purple that I want. Now the cool thing is, put this over here. Look at the opacity of that, but it's still see-through. So it's still a wash. It still has the properties of a wash, but now it's purple and it's a little bit more opaque. So maybe I get away with one coat and I'm done. As opposed to 14 coats of this or two or three coats and maybe I mess up at some point. So that being said, I've got my wash here. Put this off to the side. And this is how I wash stuff. So I will grab two brushes. They're both big. Um, obviously, if you have to put a wash in a very small spot, grab a smaller brush. But I like these big hobby brushes because they'll they'll hold a lot of wash and they'll suck off a lot of wash. So, mm -hmm. what are you laughing at? <laughs> Sorry. Where? Okay, I already lost the green figure that I had. Okay, I got it. <laughs> All right, let's move this back up. Look at this power of technology. He's got an enlarger. All right. Okay. So, geez. I may not be making anyone else laugh, but I'm making you laugh, so that's all that's important. Um, so let's say I want to put shadows on, on the side of this wing right here. Um, I need to mix up more of this. Sorry, I'm just... One thing when you're mixing paints, don't be stingy. I used to I used to mix up just barely enough, and then I found I was constantly having to remix my paint, and it sucked. So um, mix up a little bit more. It's expensive, but it's not that expensive. Paint is not that expensive, and you know, in the big picture. All right, so I've got my ink, put a little on my brush, like this, and I'm gonna put it on an area that is larger than I think I need. So I covered up more than I wanted. Take the second brush. It needs to be a little damp, so I usually lick it real quick. It's clean, so if you're not a brush licker or that's super gross, um, get a little piece of paper that's damp or something. Um, but you don't want it. You don't want to. You don't want to inundate this area with water. You just want to have enough to kind of soak it and pull it off. So you see that purple is now looking working really nicely with that green. Who knew? That this color theory stuff would pay off one day. Um, that's where I always had problems with color theory because it never worked. Red never worked with green for me. It always made some muddy color. Well, that's because red doesn't work with this color green. Um, it works with certain color greens, but it doesn't work with yellowy green. So remember that. So I put that wash on, pull it off can pull it off on the other side as well so it doesn't have a hard edge and then I let that dry now hopefully what I'm hoping is I put enough opaque color in there for it to tint that color and I don't ever have to touch it again that's my that's my one wash so let's take this color right here what would be our um, contrasting color for this let's 
grab our, our handy dandy color guide. So, I mean, that really does look day glove. That's amazing. Sometimes it amazes me that, I mean, the saturated color thing just friggin' works. So we've got, so we've got darker purple, which could be this lime green over here. Um, but we've highlighted with more of a magenta. So you could go one of two ways. Um, you could go with, with the lime green as your color. So if we take that, we can do any of these lime greens. These will all complement the darker purple. Um, so we could get way down in here is more of a, a olive color. So that might work. Um, if we're putting that in our shadows, that might be a good idea because it's, it's a darker color. Um, but we've also got magenta, which is in our highlights. So that's way over here. And its complement is starting to get more of this bluish green, which funny, we've got bluish green in here. Hot diggity dog. That's how it goes. So anyways, um, let's make a wash with those colors. So maybe we put those highlights in, we put all our highlights in, and now we're going to make a wash with, with the shadow color. Um, and maybe that will uh, sort of soften those highlights that we put down dark, deep. Um, I think for this, I want it to be more of this teal color. So I'm going to choose the soft tone ink, which is a little bit lighter. Um, if you've got an actual teal ink, or something that you could put in there, that would work as well, or a teal wash. Um, obviously, get rid of that brown. But let's grab a little bit of this. I'm gonna put it in here. Ooh, that made a really cool tealy. Yeah, I'm digging that. Okay, never mind. The brown was the right choice. So we got that. And now, I really do need some sort of uh, ceramic tile palette. <laughs> for washes, but what is? All right, so we got this here. I'm gonna go back up. I'm gonna go so close, it hurts. All right, so I have two really bad brushes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna apply with this brush because it's got a little bit of a point left on it. This one will start giving me a crazy application. Also this one, I want those little extra hairs that are going in different directions to kind of give me a weird texture when I'm, when I'm uh, wiping the paint off the model. So it may not give it to me, but, but I'm setting myself up for success. Maybe it will, and that would be cool. So, yes. So you're mixing a little bit of paint with the wash to make it more opaque and to blend the color you're looking for? Or was it two washes? Uh, I'm I'm making I'm adding color to to change that color for one. So it goes from like a dark brown to blue or red or green ish. Um, but it also can help with the coverage more. So it will help blend. So like if we look at this, let me place this in right here, all over in his neck. Now I'll take the second brush and I'll take, I'll take away, away a bunch of it. And I always got a paper towel next to me so I can kind of wipe my brush off multiple times if I have to. And get down on the underside. So that just kind of put a fog, <laughs> a darker fog over this back part right there. Um, put this one in right here. Did that make sense on my answer for that question? Hopefully. It's not, my washes don't really blend my colors. If that, if that was the question, I'm not, I mean, I guess you could, if you put enough of the opaque color in there, you could get, you could kind of get a blending uh, thing. Um, it's more for making stuff darker. I do do the second brush blend type thing to kind of make it so there's not a harsh line where my shadow was. He said, oh. not really. Okay. <laughs> so you didn't answer the question. Um, Maybe I don't understand the question. What two styles of paint did you use? Oh, oh. So I used, so I start with a wash. So this is a soft tone ink. 
and then I add my opaque color to that to make it not so see-through and to uh, change the color a little bit. So you're adding paint? To I'm adding a wash. regular paint to a wash. Yes. And I do this all the time. So um, I'm always adding, like changing my the color of my wash quite a bit. So now um, that's how I can put washes in and then keep them from leaving a line or something. Um, you also want to, uh, again, this is an optional thing. You want a dark line. So I've got these colors right here. Um, I've got this really dark purple right here. So I'm actually going to take that color and take this dark purple. I'm going to mix it with our greenish color and it's going to make an even darker color. So the reds and the blues in there are working together. They hate each other. It's like the bloods and the crips. And they're like, man, we are going to make this color super dark. And so that's what we're doing. <laughs> you can have fun with these things, right? Um, anyways, red and blue tend to make a darker purple. That's a greenish color, but it doesn't matter. It's all going to turn into a really, really dark color. So I take that dark color. I'm going to add a little bit of water to it to thin it out just a little bit. I want it to be see-through, but I don't want it to be too see-through because, again, I don't want to have to do this too many times. So I put that on there, and now I can um, start making things darker. So like in between his lips, I can put a really dark shadow in. Now this is an optional, this is an optional thing. If you're just trying to get these on your gaming table, I would not do this. But if you're, I know there's a bunch of you out there in this class that want to do higher end stuff. Um, this is the key to making your models be more focused. So I go through and I outline literally everything um, multiple times. So up in the highlight areas, I might only hit it once. Shadow areas, I may hit it twice or three times. Um, I'm using that little bit of translucency to the paint so that it's not it's not perfectly dark the first time. Sometimes it takes two or three hits to get it really, really dark. But I can come around and just start hitting oops, all of these areas. Boom, boom, boom. I can also start making uh, details that aren't there, even on a sculpt. And I know I get in trouble with that a lot on Shadows figures. <laughs> I just start making details. And and so you're literally just painting in, um, freehanding in little lines and stuff and then making cracks that aren't there or stuff like that. Um, right, question? Yes. Um, hold on. Wow, wow. my eyesight's eyesight getting, getting really bad. Um, Join the club. I know, I'm sorry. All right. All right. He's pointing at the ink and saying wash. I realize I have inks, tones, washes, and liners. It's getting crazy. Okay. Is there really a difference? Like, is there a difference between inks, tones, washes, and liners? Yes. Let me show you right here. That was that's an excellent question. And this is just turning into how to paint a figure. <laughs> so okay. So we have that our wash have that consistency, right? So this is a wash. This is a wash with opaque color in it. We changed the tone. And we also change, or we changed the color. We also changed how opaque it is, so it's darker. This is ink right here. Now, granted, all inks are a little bit different. This is the mother of all inks. If you don't, if you only had one ink, this is the one you should have, and it's called uh, Payne's Gray, right there. Boom, Payne's Gray. It's from Dalarani. It's a blue black. Um, it's a classic um, kind of. Uh, uh, oil painters color type of thing but here's here's what ink looks like here's the difference so this is straight out of the bottle that's super dark and super opaque so that's that's a problem when you're trying to do this <laughs> but you can use that even as your ally 
So I'm always trying to let the colors and the different types of paints work together. So if I need this a little bit darker, I could either A, put some black into it, or I could take a very small amount of Payne's Gray and mix it in as well. This is like drying out on my page as we speak. That's why I use a wet palette too normally. But um, so we get that now. See how that's more see-through because I mixed it in with my wash, but it is still darker than all of these colors. I, I was able to adjust it with my Payne's Gray ink. So inks are far more saturated. They're a little bit semi-gloss, so they're a little bit glossy. That may be a problem if you don't if you don't want a glossy look on your figure. I do find that shadows look better if they're semi-gloss though. They'll look darker. So, um, so using an ink in conjunction with a wash, in conjunction with your regular paint, can be a nice com combination to make it a little semi-gloss, a color, and also darker at the same time. Um, that was probably confusing, but. Uh, now, the, the Reaper liners, they're a little bit see-through, and I wish I had one sitting around next to me, um, I'd show it, but um, they work really, really well. They're a dark color, and they're a little bit see-through. Um, and I think they're they're just thicker consistency than a wash. So what I did here, where I made the wash darker, and then maybe add a little bit of the ink into it, and then now that's my liner, that would be equivalent of maybe a Reaper liner. So there are reasons to use all of them. I know people that just paint with Reaper liners. <laughs> I mean, it's it, at the end of the day, it's all paint, and it is how you manipulate it. Um, but using it effectively for how you paint is is probably the biggest key um, so the liners work great in that sense um, another one is reaper has clear colors and for the longest time i thought the word clear meant they were see-through it doesn't mean that at all they are completely opaque the clear means they are one pigment color so magenta is magenta so when we talk about a saturated color that's why i think one of my favorite magentas is Reaper Clear Magenta because it is a very vibrant magenta and it's because there are no other colors um, inside of it making it duller. It's just pure saturated color. So um, that being said, this Nocturna color is really, really vibrant too. And it's definitely got some other colors in it, but it's whatever pigment they use for it is, is very bright. So, you, you know, if you're looking for a bright color, choose bright colors. Um, bright saturated colors. Um, any other questions on that? On the on the washes, the washes or the dark lining? So Jane brought up a good point. Um, she said that she thinks the confusion is coming because uh, Shadows of Brimstone's paints are calling that color an ink when really it's more towards a wash than it is an ink. So, wait, did I use an ink? I did. Holy cow. Yeah. So, well, maybe there are inks. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who hired me to do this free class anyway? It's like... Welcome to Painting with Aaron, guys. Every day is I a new discovery. I do not read anything. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think these are inks. These are washes. Yeah, that's what, that's what Jane's saying. So what... Yeah, because I pulled out another one and I saw it said ink and I was like, oh, they have inks now too. Um, but Wait, they don't. Is this one of the happy mistakes? This is, that holy cow, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. Like, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys just wasted two hours of your life. <laughs> um, okay, no. so 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 these say inks. Okay, I got it. I got it. These say inks. I think they're washes. I mean, they might be inks, but to me, that's not an ink. That's a wash. Like, if you look at GW's washes... So here's another one. These are definitely washes. Same thing, super see-through. So uh, maybe maybe they did start out as an ink, but they 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 knocked them back enough to the to where they would look like a wash. Obviously, if I took if I took this Payne's gray right here and I put a ton of water in it and then put it on, I've got a much lighter color as well. But I don't. I'm not a big fan of watering down inks. I, I, again, an ink is there. It has so much saturated color, and there's so much power in this color right here that why would you want to do this? Now, I get it. Maybe you just need a, a, a 
to a shadow, like a real subtle shadow. But I think one of these colors over here could do that much more efficiently. And even with this, you have a lot of chances with inks. The, the pigment is so saturated and so strong, getting those watermarks and stuff, bad news. Um, so speaking of watermarks, let's just talk about why they occur and how to get rid of them. Um, so when you're painting, you're clearly always painting on paper. Now, um, so let's say that this right here is the miniature. This is the surface of the miniature right there, okay, that line. And when you put your paint on, it goes on in this blob like this. And usually when people do washes or they thin out their paints, um, it goes on thick like this. Um, and you've got these little pigments suspended in water all over the place. And when you first put it on, it looks fantastic. Um, and then 20 minutes later, around it has this little ring all the way around and you're like gosh darn it so then you put another layer on and that ring gets worse <laughs> i don't know why that's just how it works so here's what happens those pigments are here the pigments get sucked with the water tension the surface tension to the edges of the water all the way around and then those get sucked down to the corners so this is your line right there that's what you end up with so to fix this and granted this looks like a big blob of water this is like magnified 8,000 times it's not very big you know a big like puddle of water it's very small but to fix this you want to put your thinned out paint really thin onto the model so that's why you see a lot of people they'll be wiping their brush off on their on their towel on their rag or their towel or whatever so now all those little pigments happen right there and they only have one place to go straight down because it dries quickly um, when I learned this, I learned it from, uh, uh, we had brought out a French painter named Jeremy Bonamont, um, and he, he said, you should see your paint drying as you pull the brush across. That's how thin that paint should be. So not only is it thinned out physically, but you're putting it on in a very thin layer. I've learned to put it on in that thin layer with thick paint. So now I get a thin layer of paint and I don't ever have to worry about any of this stuff. I don't have watermarks anymore. I don't have any of that stuff because I paint with much thicker paint. So that's why you get watermarks. Your, your paint is too thick, you know, your bubble of paint there. So to give an idea of what is too thick, I'm just gonna put it on this model real quick and show you. Getting more than you bargained for in this, uh, dry brushing class okay so I'm gonna grab some paint that's too thick see how it's it's pooling in areas so what would be the right amount that's better so yes I can see you're like well what's the effectiveness of that that actually left some shadows this did nothing um, well, this is a very thin down thing. I would probably mix a thicker version of paint for that. Uh, maybe like this red up here. And put it on like that. So it starts turning a little bit pink, but I don't have enough of it on there to leave watermarks or anything like that. So um, it, that's an effective glaze. Um, why would you use a glaze? Glazes are usually meant to tint a color a little bit more one way or another. Um, so a little bit brighter. Maybe you want to bring in some more saturated color. So I would come in and go, okay, well, I need to tint this part of his head with that really vibrant uh, magenta. And granted, I'm going to have to do this four or five times to actually have it build up or maybe more, you know, 10 times. Um, again, it's scary because if you put that on wrong, you're going to leave a watermark and, and now you got problems again. So um, you just have to be really careful. But that's how, that's how I would use a, a, a glaze, per se. Um, so yeah, any other questions on that? Um, go back to our, our little dude here. Um, now, if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to clean up the highlight areas up here. So let me put that in there. I am going to mix up sort of a highlighty glaze. It's a really thinned out paint. 
It's just a little bit pink around my finger. Of course, I put pink on my pinkish fingernail, but um, so for something like this, I could come in. Now that glaze is not gonna do much to mess up my blends or anything because it's really, really thin, but I can just start putting it around, sort of coating it around my highlight areas and building up color. Sometimes I sort of stipple it in even. Um, it's not gonna change, it shouldn't change the color very much at all because it's so thin. But what it will start doing is it starts filtering and making those blends look smoother. So slowly but surely, and this is what takes time. Like when you talk to professional painters or, you know, competition painters and they're like, oh yeah, I got, I got the main paint job done really, really quickly. But then I spent four weeks doing this. Um, and you always run the risk of wrecking it because you're touching the model so many times. So um, you just got to be careful. But if you notice, I didn't use my real light highlight over here. I used... Um, there. I, I'm using my color over here. See, it's more saturated. It's technically darker than the color over here. But this is the color I'm using to glaze in my highlights. Because of that saturation, it makes things way more they just pop more so i'm also i'm also using my brush and and kind of i'm grabbing in the in the area where it's a little darker and i'm kind of pulling the paint up into my highlight area so i'm pushing a little bit harder with my brush and like kind of like scraping the paint up and then when i pull away it deposits paint in the highlight so i'm just kind of putting those back in there now you might find that after doing this a few times you start losing the really bright highlight, but you start getting a more blended thing. So I can always come back in, grab a little bit of my highlight color again, and replace it right on top there. Just get a little bit of a shiny area. So to make things look shiny, you got to jump from that mid-tone to your highlight almost really quickly. See up here? I've got mid-tone all over this thing, and then boom, it's a highlight right there. That that makes it really, really um, shiny looking. If I put highlights everywhere, it's no longer shiny. So can drag that highlight down, but it's much thinner. So yeah, that just makes it look kind of shiny. So you see I'm getting some shiny spots, all that. So looks pretty cool. All right, any other questions on that front? Sweet. Time is at 521. All right, um, so that is my dry brushing and shadowing uh, little course here. Um, hopefully that helps you. Uh, doesn't Like I said before, it doesn't matter if you're a high-end painter, low-end painter, whatever. I think you can use dry brushing effectively. Um, and most of it comes down to your color choices and, um, and just building up those colors. Being patient, build up those colors, get them really vibrant, and make something look really, really cool. Like if we turn it around, boom. See, that's very desaturated and you can't see anything. Boom. Much more saturated. So, um, and it went fairly quickly. I probably could paint all six of these guys, or what is it, three in a squad? I could paint these in under two hours that this class took. You know, finished, done. Uh, maybe even do the basis. So it goes very, very fast, and it's like one way to get your stuff on the table. It looks really good. It looks electric, and it's it's fun, you know. So it doesn't take a lot. Uh, the highlights at the end take a little bit of know-how, getting them in right and having precision. But all the dry brushing, I think that pretty much anybody can do it. So um, go ahead and try that out and see what happens. Um, we have uh, uh, I don't know if we have a link to the Discord or not, but... I, I just posted it, but we do have a question. Okay, so if you guys wanna to go to our Discord, like if you try it out and you're not one of our Miniature Monthly members, if you are, you could just do it in our show and tell in the Miniature Monthly Discord. But if you go to our, our free Discord, um, you can always feel free to post pictures and, and you know if you have little questions or whatever, and we'll try to get to it in a somewhat timely manner. <laughs> All right, um, so Tommy said, when you put down the first initial teal layer, was your brush moist then? No. It was. It, it had more paint on it, though, for sure. 
So it wasn't it wasn't what you think as like like a traditional dry brush. Like these final layers was very. Oh, I need to wash that brush out. Um, <laughs> I don't want to wreck my brush. So the final layers um, weren't. Uh, we're much more like a traditional dry brush where you have most of the paint rubbed off your brush. That first, those first layers was more like this. So it was like, you can kind of see the wet paint right on top. It was more wet because what I wanted with that is I wanted coverage. So let me pull this one. So I wanted it to actually cover. So see how that actually covered like paint. Maybe that's too much. So I'll knock a little of that off. That's the cool thing. You can put you can put a dab of paint on your model, take off paint off of your brush, and then dry brush with what was there, whatever was on the model itself. If you're smart, you put that first dab of paint where you want it to actually be teal, and then everywhere else it just sort of blends out into whatever color you know. If it's black or white, this was a black white zenithal prime, so um, I'm just kind of blending it out. And sometimes if you get lucky, like I'm an opportunist. <laughs> Maybe I'm like, oh, that color is actually pretty cool. I'm gonna put a couple highlights on it and I'm done. So I'm using the Zenithal Prime that's a little bit darker. You see the darker areas still stay darker and the lighter areas still stay lighter because I put such a thin layer down. Now, if I just keep adding to it, if I keep insisting on this, I will start losing that, that Zenithal Prime. But maybe I do it in the shadows like that so I got it much more opaque in the shadows and then just keep working my way out. Me, I'm, I'm hitting my dry brush is very light and very light with my touch. So that's another thing that you could uh, experiment with is how hard your brush is touching the model. I had a friend who, paint, who paints like this. <laughs> like just, just mashes it. <laughs> Maybe not, maybe not quite that hard, but it's like, it's very aggressive. It's just push, you know, pushing it around. Whereas maybe you want it to be really light and delicate and you're just barely letting the paint fall off the brush. So little things like that, um, you know, there's, there's lots of, even within your own paint style, there's lots of reasons why you would push harder or softer. But, um, but in this case, I, I, I put that first initial paint on and then I'm real soft with my brush and I move it around. And eventually that paint runs out and it runs out in the fashion of a blend. And I mean, that's awesome, you know? Like if I wanna put, let's say um, that, so that tealy color would look great with some orange in it because blue and orange work. Granted it's teal, but you know what? Sometimes you can get close to color theory and it still works. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of that orange, maybe put it on the backs of his elbows here. I'm gonna do it real light. If it seems like it's too much, I can rub off more on my hand and just keep hitting it. I can also use my finger and rub stuff off. But now I've got a little bit of orange on the back of his elbow there, which could be dirt, it could be um, you know, just a, a subtle color change that looks cool. Um, probably in this guy's case, it would definitely be dirt because he's, he's like a crazy, crazed rat werewolf animal thing. Um, so just kind of build that up. But see, it, it almost looks, it just looks blended. And that's because I, I was, you know, in those first initial things, I put it on and then I mushed it around and moved it around on my thumb. Like even on my thumb, it just looks kind of blended. Very cool. I could come back. This is how I do things really quick. I'm like, oh, that looks good. What would be a finishing move on this? Let's put a little bit more of that exact color, super saturated. I'm gonna put some little dots on the back of his leg here, his elbow. Boom, that, see how, see how that saturated color is really, really effective. All right, we have a question. Okay. All right, Knut said, when working on huge models like Vermithrax, rest in peace. Is there anything you do differently versus smaller minis? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I paint my underwear more. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so with Vermithrax, um, with these models, a lot of my smaller models, I actually do the Xenothal Prime, and then I, I 
put my colors on via a paintbrush, whether it be dry brushing or wet blending. Um, and then I use the airbrush to enhance those colors, like maybe push my shadows, uh, maybe bring in more saturation, something like that. So that's that's on a, on a small figure. On a bigger figure, um, like even, let's take, um, it's not time for this yet, but we might as well look at it. Uh, Ooh, are you getting sneaky yeah. peeks? Sneak oh. peeks? So this, so is, this the is the Goliath, Goliath model. My colors are a little off on my camera. Actually, they're not off on my camera. It's off on Manicam. But um, so he looks almost like this. <laughs> but you can see I have very vibrant colors. So like on this guy, um, I started mostly with I started with the airbrush, and then I went back in with some dry brushing, and then some layering, and then some you know going in and picking out all the details. So it was kind of it was kind of more heavy airbrush at the start. Um, like the the tentacles were a bright a really vibrant. Uh, purple up on top down to almost black and then um, and then I started putting in highlights and, and pushing more shadows in areas where the airbrush missed or something like that so that would be a difference there um, with vermithrax I started with the airbrush to get the initial paint on and then I started modifying it heavily with dry brushes and it was it was a bunch of dry brushes in different angles with different hues of color. That's the other thing. Like I showed you, we used one, two, three, you know, we basically used purple and, uh, and lipstick to highlight this guy. Um, but you could go in and you could change up those colors. So you could go each, each individual layer could, it could jump between warm and cool colors. Um, you know, so you could have a warmer purple, a cooler purple, a warmer purple, a cool, cooler purple. And sometimes that gives you a really interesting effect. Um, not always, but sometimes. So, so when I'm doing bigger figures, I think I start off more heavy with the airbrush. Then I switch. If it's something real wrinkly, um, the dry brush works fantastically for sort of starting to pick all that stuff out. But again, like even with this guy, I went back in and I physically detailed everything. So it took forever. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it just, the bigger figures, I would, I would definitely use my airbrush more, but that's not to say that I don't use my airbrush a lot for everything. So, okay, next. If there are any, if not, we'll start looking at figures. Um, oh no, there's no more questions. Okay, all right, cool. So that's it. You can all go home now. I'm um, just kidding. Um, let's see what I'm doing. Okay, so as we all know, um, uh, Shadows of Brimstone, the guys from Flying Frog, redid the corsets, um, and the figures are fantastic. So I got, um, they started me off with digital prints um, because we were in a, like, under the gun. We had to get stuff done. And then eventually they got the plastics in, so I got to paint the, the last half of all the figures are the actual plastics that you'll be getting in uh, when you buy the sets. Um, that being said, these models are, are pretty freaking awesome. Um, let's see here. Let me switch. Just the one. I think it was this one. Okay. Move all this stuff out. I can't get over how good that purple looks. Anyways, um, so I'm going to show you pictures of these real quick, and then um, I've also got pictures uh, that I took. And we'll look at those as well. So then if maybe some of these pictures don't come out or if they come out a little fuzzy, it'll be okay. So this is the Goliath. He's brand new. Um, he came with a cool base topper. Um, I added dirt effects, some some uh, watch gears, and some railroad pieces and stuff. I, uh, it, it comes with Darkstone. So it was really flattering. They said that, that my bases, when I first did it, um, they didn't really have any direction as far as the bases should be. They were just like, yeah, maybe put you know a shovel on it or something. So I made these crazy bases with Darkstone and stuff because I figured the bigger the bigger characters, um, they're going to be guarding gar Darkstone. So that was one theme. If you notice, anything that's big or a boss or something has a little bit of Darkstone on their base. Um, they're guarding it. So they put Darkstone in there, all excited. Um, so what do I do? I add a lot more Darkstone. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm like, he's the Goliath, you know? And I, I needed a little bit of something in between his legs because it just seemed very open and, and empty. Um, so anyways, I may have overdone it a little bit. Um, <laughs> Scott said to, to tone it down a little bit on the Harbinger. But um, but still, super cool. And, um, you know, I, I made all the Darkstone Charger made from Milliput. 
um, and I just make little uh, uh, sausages of it, let that dry, and then I come back in and I cut, you see these real close, I, I cut angles into it, and then I just paint that. So um, very, very cool, super, pretty easy. It's a little bit fiddly. I, I usually paint them separate and then put them all on the base and hope that my highlights work, um, but very, very cool. So this is the Goliath. Uh, this back. No, the Harbinger last. Um, so that's the Goliath. Uh, here is the Slasher. If I get these names wrong, just tell me because um, I'm an idiot. And also, I've got a lot of other things to think about here with camera focusing and stuff. Um, so this is the Slasher. One of my favorite models, period. Um, he came out really, really cool. And it, I, I did a lot of uh, stippling on this and sponge like doing sponge work and then glazes and stuff to kind of glaze it all together. And then obviously airbrushing and stuff. Um, it's very unique because a lot of the highlight areas are actually black. So um, very strange when you're painting it because you're like, I want to go lighter and lighter as I go up, but I, it's actually darker. Like if you notice the top of his head is black, like where you'd think a highlight would be. But I actually made all the light right in the front. So it keeps you centered on the, on the front of the face. Anyways, um, Super fun model to paint. Uh, I can't wait to paint mine. So, got that one. Hellbats. The Hellbats are definitely a step up from before. Here's here's a before and after, actually, right next to each other. Um, so, they're taller, for one. Definitely more detailed. And they don't have any of the weird, like, these ones have, like, this weird dirt all over them. I don't know what that was. I don't think anybody knows what that was. Um, the other change that we made from the initial, the original paint job was putting leathery wings on them and stuff. So um, this model's super cool. Uh, I'm actually using those, uh, the older models, and just to show you some of the stuff I'm working on right now, I'm doing my Caverns of Cinder set. Um, so I'm doing my, my Lava Men. And granted, these are very fast paint jobs. Like, I don't have a lot of time to work on this. So this is a secret weapon miniatures base. So they have lava bases. So I just used that, put him on top. And I wanted, um, I know the box art I did a long time ago was um, there was fire all over him. But I wanted it to be very focused in the middle. So right around his face. So I'm also doing, they have lava bats. And granted, this is barely just base coated. So you see how messy my painting is when I start. Um, and I just clean it up from there. But this is the this is the initial idea. I wanted to have same sort of smog type idea, like the fire in the belly and then it's coming out of the tentacle area. But th I think these are going to be really cool. Now, how I'm going to incorporate that into the wings, I'm not quite sure yet, but super fun model. So anyways, if you want something that you can do with your old models, you're getting all the new ones and you're like, hey, I'm only using new models now, maybe do some of these alternate figures um, from some of the other sets because that can be really cool. So we've also got the Cookie Monster. He's this guy. This this guy is one of my favorite models of the whole set. Um, he is super cool. It's super fun painting all that fur. It's 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 a nightmare. Much easier if you just dry brushed it. Just gonna throw that out there. Um, the other difference between the original paint job that I did and this one is we actually made the rocks rocks. In the original one, he was all blue, and I think uh, over time we like. I think that was actually a fan thing. Fans were painting the rocks rocks. I never thought much about it because I just do what they're t what I'm told, you know. Um, and so Scott was like, "Hey, we should probably make those rocks. It makes sense." And so we did, and I think it looks really cool. But his creepy yellow eyes, super cool. Um, I remember I found a, a little token uh, when I was painting the studio version the first time, and we put it in his hand like he was eating a cookie or something. I don't know. Super cute. Anyways, um, the next ones are the the tentacles, and this is the brand new sculpt of tentacle. I actually like that. It's got a cool feng shui wave to it. Um, these are actually much tealer. I don't know why, but my camera photographs this teal. Like if you look at this teal color, it looks lime green. I don't know why, but it does. So it this you're not seeing it actually how it is, but it's pretty close. Um, these are all the new tentacles. Uh, the suckers and everything are very much better defined and stuff. Um, very cool. And I just took some Vallejo uh, earth pigment stuff and put it around the outside edge of the base. Done. Or maybe I sculpted those. I don't know. But anyways, that's how I'd probably do it. Um, this is the slasher. Much larger than the originals. Um, and super cool. I mean, lots of 
intricate little details in there. This would be a perfect one, again, for dry brushing. I didn't dry brush this one, but um, I think you could totally dry brush. See how I used the use of some of those kicker colors? I used some, some purples in the shadows back here, which kind of works in, ties in with the magenta around the face. So I wanted to kind of keep those colors similar. Um, yeah, just super, super cool. Uh, we've got, I'll save those for the last, or almost last. So we've got the spiders. Spiders are super awesome. Um, actually, uh, I did, uh, one of the things that got me the idea to do this airbr or this dry brushing class was I, uh, I had showed one of my students who's in the class today, <laughs> Lyndon, um, how to dry brush this model. And it literally, we did it in like five minutes. From the, the initial dark base coat, I built up the colors and then I put little bitty dot highlights all the way around. Then I used that wash. I did a, I made a, a magenta wash and put it in the back of the of there and boom. I mean, I would totally play with those models. And it took like literally five, seven minutes each model. So um Lyndon said it was magic. Yeah, it was I you know what's funny is like, okay, so I'm the teacher. I'm supposed to know that this is gonna happen. Like it surprised even me. I was like, wow, that looks fantastic. Like <laughs> so anyways, um that's why it pays to to try different things and just just do some experiments, you know. Um use the knowledge that you have. Um, people always ask me, what do you invest in when you're miniature painting and stuff? And, and I always tell them, invest in your knowledge, invest in your learning, you know, whether that just be spending millions of hours on YouTube, looking at every single video that they have, or, or, uh, you know, we have a Patreon. Um, there's a lot of different guys out there, uh, men and women that have Patreon services that are sharing what they've learned over years and years and years. Like when I did, when I learned wet blending, it took me almost seven years to figure it out. Like figure out why it was working and why it wasn't, and just all the ins and outs of it. And um, and that's something you take my wet blending class and you just you you understand. You may not be able to do it right away, but you understand all the pitfalls that I ran through over the years. So um, you know, investing in your learning is a good thing, I think. But also, you got to practice. You got to put paint on models. So. You know, it's just one of those things. If you can go to all these classes, you can do all these free things online and stuff. But if you never touch paint to your model, you ain't going to learn anything. So um, practice, 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 practice. And if you can practice anything after this, um, actually, I'd be really flattered if, if I started seeing a lot of really saturated paint jobs in the Discord. <laughs> um, because that shows that you guys are experimenting and, and you're trying to figure out how that color works and, and stuff like that. So remember, saturated color comes forward, it, it, it attracts attention, desaturated color um, recedes, so it's great for shadows, and it, and it doesn't grab any attention at all. So you can control where I look at your models, you can control everything. Um, if you look at this guy, perfect example, much more saturated in these areas, on the face, on his leg, see how it gets quickly desaturated as it goes up his body? Boom, so you look at his leg, his arm, his face, done. So, um, Next ones are uh, the Hungry Dead, and these are freaking awesome. I mean, what an upgrade over the <laughs> the original box set. <laughs> Which, <laughs> to to be fair, they didn't even have me paint any of the originals. Like, if that tells you anything. But um, these guys are awesome. These guys are worth. I think these guys are worth the new box set by themselves. Um, I had a ton of fun painting them. You can see the hole right through his stomach there. There's a hole through his shirt. Um, very, very cool. Uh, and then this guy over here, this is the one I actually did off the plastic set. Um, but super fun to paint. These guys are fairly easy. They'd be great for dry brushing as well. Um, the washes work great because you can put some of those desaturated orangey kind of washes in them. It looks like dirt and grit and grime and stuff. Um, very cool. These guys are awesome. I love them. Absolutely love them. Um, and then last... We've got this really big dude. This is the Harbinger. So you see, okay, so this is like green, but it's more tealy green, and it looks like really bright green in the picture, but whatever. Um, so this is the Harbinger. He looks super awesome. Uh, he's much more detailed than the first one. All the cracks in the wings and stuff, perfect. I may have added a few more than are actually there, but you know how it goes. Um, look at his face. His face is amazing. It's just absolutely beautiful. That fly will not get off these miniatures. Um, that fly is in here? He's, <gasps> yeah, can you see him? How rude. I know. 
So anyways, I put a shotgun there. Uh, the shotgun I got from Reaper Miniatures. They make a lot of little bits and stuff, like the like uh, Old West weapons and stuff that don't have hands on them, which is really nice. They also make Uzis and submachine guns and stuff. Um, I, I sculpted a little railroad track here. Um, the, the main rock is actually there. The skulls are all come with the kit. Um, all the dark stone that's going straight up and down is in there. All the stuff that's kind of sideways is me. So I put a lot less dark stone in this guy. I think he looks really cool. I mean, the model itself came out fantastically. He's, he's a great one to start with the airbrushing first. Um, and then, you know, sort of build up the layering and stuff on him later. But super, super cool model. Now, um, that is all the models. Um, any questions about those? Everyone's just been talking about how awesome they look and how excited they are for the new set. Except for maybe like, oh man, they should get a new painter. <laughs> Nobody said that yet. I've, I've, Although Peter did just say yep. So yeah, I don't yeah. know who's yepping me or you. <laughs> So one thing, one thing I will share with you guys, this is an insider, uh, this is the deep knowledge right here, is you will never be happy with your work. And you will always uh, be not as good as you are. Um, sometimes you are really bad. <laughs> and sometimes you are really good. But um, I think the key to things is try to keep a positive attitude and, and just really push and, and try to learn as much as you can. Um, sometimes painting can be super disappointing and sometimes it can be like elation when something comes out exactly like you wanted or, or, or those saturated colors Aaron's been talking about totally work and they do. Um, but then sometimes you put a saturated color on something and it looks like crap. And so, um, I think part of all of this is just in your painting journey is stay positive. Um, talk to your friends, try to learn as much as you can and practice a whole, whole bunch. Um, I'm going to just switch over because I, I, these are the actual studio pictures I took. So all this stuff was just on a light background, quick pictures that I shot off to, um, to the boys over at Flying Frog. So this is the Hungry Dead. Um, and hopefully maybe you can actually see these in a little bit clearer. Uh, the funny thing is, so uh, when, when we first painted these, when I first painted these, um, I put in perfect teeth. And Scott was like, I just feel like... <laughs> like a zombie saloon girl would not have perfect teeth, you know, like same with the same with the prospector. And so I was like, you know, what? you're totally right. So I repainted them to look all janky. And I think it totally worked. So um, put in those like crookedy teeth. You see them here. They're not all perfect. There's some bigger spacing and stuff. So a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun because I could put in a lot of uh, uh, little textures and stuff on the clothing. Um, I'm finding like uh, if if uh, I just released um, uh, I've done a whole series on the Hulk, the Incredible Hulk on our Patreon, a miniature monthly, and I just did released a couple videos where I talk about doing uh, you know pants and doing all the fibers and stuff and and making it look like frayed denim and stuff. So um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I think he's my well I don't know I really like the Sling Girl so I, I don't know. Um, Maybe, maybe you guys can uh, talk about which, which figures are your favorites. This is, this is the other guy. This is the third guy. He's the third wheel. Um, he's the one that you, can, that you can either put a club or a different hand or whatever. He's pretty cool. Um, the the prospector has a thing of dynamite. I didn't even know. Like, so have you ever been painting a figure and you just miss what um, all the parts of it? <laughs> I didn't realize he had dynamite till almost the end. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's dynamite there. I'd rather paint it like that. Here is the spider, super close-up picture of a very small miniature. Um, those ones are fun. Uh, I'm definitely, I think my color scheme here at home, I've got a red color scheme for Tradera. Um, no, yeah, is it Tradera? Tarva. No, Tradera. Yeah, so Tradera has uh, spiders in it. Um, so I made a red set for that, and I'm going to make them look kind of mechanical. So maybe have some chip paint, and there's like some metal showing through. That would be cool. Um, and then I also have, I think my regular set's uh, teal or green or something. Um, the tentacles here, um, again, just a better, cleaner sculpt of the tentacles. Um, they came out really cool. Uh, and again, like you can do uh, different sets of tentacles. I have uh, green ones for my tentacles in the blasted waste. So that's kind of fun. Um, Slasher, nice close-up picture of him. I just really like the vibrant colors and then the dark black. You see how that contrast really, really works? 
Um, and I, I really dig um, pushing that. The, the contrast between saturated, saturated colors and desaturated colors I think is a very interesting one. Um, here's the Cookie Monster, Night Terror. Still, I just love him. He's super cool. Um, I think this little bottle down here was, it might have been from Reaper or it was a train kit. I think it was a train kit actually. Um, if you go to your local train store, um, they have little plastic kits for modifying cabooses and stuff. And you can get all kinds of little metal bits off of them. I've never made a uh, caboose brake system, but I've used the caboose brake system on a lot of Shadows of Brimstone figures. So um, using little stuff like that is it can be really cool. Um, uh, the slashers, again, way better this time around. Like I, I really like the old ones. <laughs> I did some for the Blasted Waste as well because that's one of the other uh, models that you can do in different sets. And so I made some conversions and stuff, but this one came out really, really cool. Um, the Goliath, super rad, super, super just imposing figure. I think the eyes are sculpted better on this one too. I mean, all the detail is much tighter, but little things like the eyes um, are very, very cool. Um, Harbinger, again, still one of my favorite figures. I still want to paint one of these and put it up on top of my monitor on my desk, just sort of pin him up there or something. I think that would be cool, him looking down over me. Going, don't mess up that paint job um we've got oh here's some other stuff <laughs> so uh void swarms um this is uh straight from like the concept art um, and the void hive i think looks really cool with that dripping honey and everything um i think if i were to do it again i would do it uh like for my own stuff i like how on the box art it actually has it almost looks like fire coming out of the each one of these cocoons or uh, out of the out of the hive itself um, I think that would be kind of cool. So here's another shot of those. And then um, this is my tribute uh, to my dad. Um, he's not dead, but, you know, he's still alive. But anyway, still tribute to him. Um, he, had a, he had a yellow Ford Model A truck, really old one. It was a hot rod. And that thing was, it was an automatic, but it could peel out. It was the first automatic I ever saw peel out. And um, he had a Mickey's Liquor. It was bright yellow, and he had a Mickey's Liquor sticker on the back of the truck. And so when I was doing these, they said, hey, maybe do, like, two different versions of it. And I thought, that would be really cool if one of the Void Swarms was Mickey's Liquor. And I think I nailed it. Um, the only thing different, I actually grabbed the wrong picture. Um, they asked me to redo the eyes. Like, I, I kind of dig these eyes, so I'm glad I put it on this one. But um, the, the redone version is really cool, too. It actually looks like fly eyes, so, like, super little small circles. Um, you can see each eyeball. So, anyways, super cool models. Um, and then here are a couple, like, group photos of the different sets. This one I took before I had the extra tentacles um, because those were actually the plastic versions. And then here's one... Um, for the uh, City of Ancients set, and it has all the bad guys in it. So um, obviously I only painted up one of each thing and two of the spiders, but um, you can get a good idea of what all that stuff should be like. Um, so anyways, that's what I've been doing the last like three months. The, I haven't posted anything on Facebook and like look like I disappeared and quit life. Um, I've been doing a lot of studio work, like, like a lot. Um, and this is just scratching the surface. I still have all the heroes to show you in the next Hopefully you can join us for the next class, um, Painting Faces, um, and, uh, and I'll show you all the heroes from the new Shadows of Brimstone, including um, the Undead Outlaws, and I've got a bunch, I just got a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so anyways, um, I think that's it. That's, that's, that's all I got. I'm eight minutes early, so um, you know you can get a refund or whatever if you want, um, but I think that's, that, that's, that's all I got for you. Um, so yeah, any other questions or, you know, um, has anyone got a good joke they could tell? Um, um, so Marian asked when the next class is. It's going to start at 7, 7 p.m. Yeah. Eastern time. Eastern time. That's in yeah. an hour from now, basically. So Yes. We, so we have, have to, to scarf food. Poop, scarf food, maybe poop again, and then you'll be ready. Yes. Get That's your poops in. All right, guys. No shit. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, anyways, I hope you guys had fun. Um, I had a lot of fun. It was really cool seeing uh, faces. I didn't get to talk to you all that much, but uh, but seeing um, familiar faces and some new faces and stuff. Um, and uh, I guess it's the next best thing to actually having a Gen Con. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Very, very cool. Um, 
Thank you all for joining. And we will be, I will be sending this file to Flying Frog, and they will post it somewhere at some point. And I'm sure they'll put links out. We'll put links out to at Miniature Monthly. Um, once again, uh, you know, if you want to come out and check out what we're doing over Miniature Monthly, if you're not a, already a member, um, we really appreciate the support. And, you know, we can't do this without you guys, without your support. We have um, three artists and one video editor. Well, actually two with me. Um, and then Liz, who's doing all the marketing. So there's uh, five mouths that are being fed with Miniature Monthly. <laughs> um, plus families and stuff. So uh, we appreciate all your support. Um, we do have private coaching slots available for, uh, uh, I don't know if Elizabeth has any left, but Elizabeth I know- Elizabeth might be full right now. Elizabeth but might you be and full. Matt do. Me and Matt have, definitely have spots open. Um, but if you just wanna watch videos, I mean, there's we got a bunch of videos. Like we have over 80, we almost have 90. I don't know, maybe 100. Um, but it's not like your normal YouTube video where it's just like watch me paint. Um, it's, it's actually trying to teach and, you know, kind of what I did here. Um, explain how brushes work and blah, 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 all that good stuff. You know, all the boring stuff that makes you fall asleep. So um, if anything, our videos help you to fall asleep and sleep better at night. So um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so if you want to check that out, it's, I mean, for the minimum pledge, it's $5 a month. It's not very much. Um, if you want to watch Matt's videos, it's 10 um, and we appreciate any any of your Patreon patronage. So um, we also, from time to time, do do online courses like this. They're a little bit more in depth. Like I said before, at the start of this, um, you get PDF handouts. Um, we will also be doing video, like a copy of the of the actual class itself, so you can look back at it, um, stuff like that. But um, and they're they're you know probably much more in depth. I actually have full on presentations and stuff. Um, this one this one I got caught off guard a little bit. Um, but I think it was still fine, and hopefully you guys learned a lot from it. So, um, thanks again. And uh, All right. one, one, question one question before you. I'm done answer. answering questions. I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. No, you're not. Hit it. All right. So, so one, one last question. question: How do you so fix pigment, pigment powder to a base? Don't use it. Okay. <laughs> Worst answer ever. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, pigment powder to a base. So from what I've found, there's pigment fixers and I've used them and the pigment still rubs off. So it's, I don't like using pigments for gaming pieces because it's gonna rub off eventually. Um, it's a very cool thing and it's, I'm not saying don't use it, um, but for, for gaming stuff, I would not use it because it rubs off no matter what you do. Um, the only way I've found to really fix it properly is actually put it in a, in a solution. Like if you have a, 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 a matte varnish or Reaper has a brush on sealer, um, something that encapsulates the, the, the dust and then, and then dries and then there's no way it can come off. Um, the problem is that's not how most people put uh, uh, pigments on. They like dry brush them on and they powder them on and you get that really cool dusty effect, right? Um, so there's, I don't think there's any real good way of fixing it. Um, you could use isopropyl alcohol. Sometimes they say that activates something in the pigment and makes it stick better. Um, they do have pigment fixer, like I said, Secret Weapon makes it. Um, uh, it's almost best to airbrush that on because even like they always say in videos, just touch it to the side and the capillary action sucks the stuff in, but you always end up with rings. I always end up with rings. So it's, it's like kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but I don't, I don't know. I did it just like in the video. <laughs> um, so, uh, I found that airbrushing the pigment fixer on works the best for me. You could probably airbrush on like a matte sealer over it. Um, the problem is anything you use to affix it changes the way the pigment looks. A little bit um, a lot of times it looks perfect and then you put the fixer on and it goes away or um, I know matte sealer like if you use testers dull coat will make it disappear almost completely just gone so you have to put it on several times and build it up but at that point when is it gonna stop not disappearing so you don't know how like it's very it, it's it's one of those things so I would play around with it a little bit. Maybe try, um, my go-to has always been Reaper brush on sealer. I just mix that in with the pigment. Um, if, if, you, if you're dry brushing it on though, uh, maybe go with the Secret Weapon Fixer. I know MIG Pigments makes a fixer, AK Interactive, like all those companies make a fixer um, and, and airbrush it on if you can. 
uh, maybe do a lower setting with your like even at the high air pressure like I run at 40 psi and even at a higher air pressure it won't it'll blast off some of the dust um, which can be a mess in your room that's the other thing like pigments you know if, if you get a little bit of that pigment in your carpet you won't know because it just disappears and then you drop a water on, on the ground and all of a sudden you have brown carpet or red carpet or something you know it's like and then your wife kills you or your husband kills you like it, it's bad news or your parents kill you um, or Liz kills you I'll send her over and she'll just what? Um, but yeah that's 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 my that's my thought on pigments I don't use them a whole lot I mean they work but they do rub off I mean if you're gonna be if you're touching them if you're playing with your models they're gonna rub off <laughs> And then you're going to get pigment on your hand, and then you're going to put it on your shorts, and now your shorts are ruined. And, you know, it's just one of the – pigments are the gift that keeps giving. Like glitter. Like glitter. Yes, like glitter. So <laughs> the day they start making glitter, glitter paints, paints, I quit. I quit. I'm just over it. They already make glitter paints, but, but we're not going to go there. Not for That's, That's fair. fair. Well, well, maybe. maybe. All right, well, well thank, thank you guys, guys for joining. joining. We're, we're going to go eat real quick. quick. And Aaron apparently also has to poop, so. I don't have to poop, but I'm going to have to poop after uh, we eat. So okay. All right, so see, see y'all at, everyone else so see so see all at 7, 7 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time for his next class. So it's literally in an hour. From now. Yes. Right on. All right, Bye. thank you very much. I'll talk to you guys later. Good seeing everybody.